Following on from my last video all about the basics of lactate threshold, today I thought I'd go a little bit deeper and talk about the three key ways that I like to improve lactate threshold. These aren't the only ways, these are just my suggestions and what I've used and what works and a really simple process to follow. If you've got some other ways, please leave them in the comments below. Happy to hear some other methods and different types of training sessions. Like I said, by no means are these the only ways. I'm just trying to provide my suggestions and my thoughts on this topic, but I think it'd be quite useful. Just break it down simple and give you some ideas around different types of training that you may have not have considered, but then also ways we can improve that lactate threshold graph. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back to the channel, talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Please consider subscribing to the channel down below if you've been watching the content and enjoying it, or if you're joining for the first time, welcome to the channel. Hitting that big red button does help support the channel uh, and keep the videos coming. So I'd really love it if you could. Also think about clicking that bell icon as well to be notified every single time a video drops on the channel. As I mentioned in the intro, today's video is all about lactate threshold, but how we actually improve it from a practical sense. Now, I'll link it above uh, in the card here, but then down below in the description, go and check out my initial video on lactate threshold to get a full explanation of the basics of it if you're still trying to get your head around that concept. If you're pretty familiar with lactate threshold and functional threshold, all these terms that mean the same thing, stay with us and we'll talk through the practical side of things. Because I mentioned a little bit in that video about what we're essentially trying to do, and I might bring up on the screen here again, is we take an athlete who's untrained and then we train them and they, they improve, or we take an athlete at the start of their program and as they progress through their program towards the end, what we're trying to do is take this blood lactate graph. So blood lactate plotted over or a whole bunch of different increasing intensities. As intensity goes up, blood lactate is increasing, eventually hits a point where it starts to exponentially increase. That last point before that happens is our lactate threshold. Very simple recap of that previous video. But what we're trying to do is take this graph and move it to the right in, in a more higher trained way. So whether you are untrained and you're not you're not doing anything at all and you start getting into training, we want to move it to the right. But if you're a, even a reasonable to a high level athlete already, we're still trying to move it to the right. It's just where how far we can move it is dependent on how highly trained you are to begin with. So ways that we can do that. There's a couple of different methods I like to use. The first one being working as specific to threshold as possible. So preferentially working at your lactate threshold is going to teach you to be able to sustain that intensity for a little bit longer. Working at and just below lactate threshold is then much more manageable if we're trying to go and do some longer sustained efforts. And when I talk about long sustained efforts, I'm talking about things like 10 minutes, 15, 20, half an hour at a time. You're just going out and doing either a single effort type, type thing. You might go out and do a 45 to an hour's worth of like tempo running, for example, if you're a runner. You might go out and do some more, when I say race pace, 70.3 type intensity. It's not on the limit, but you're not cruising and going easy. It's that in between. So again, a bit more tempo, but we're working at intensities that are sustainable for periods of time of say 50, 60, 70, 80 minutes, because then we're going to repeat them. So we're going to do like 20 minutes on, you might then have a 10 minute recovery or a five minute recovery and then do 20 minutes on again, things like that to mix up in your rides, a really good way to help just get a little bit more stimulus. These, I will say though, aren't necessarily the most effective because it gets to a point, means to an end, where and law of diminishing returns, where there's only so much of this we can do before the body needs some other type of stimulus. Because what we're really trying to chase in terms of improving lactate threshold, specifically through lactate threshold type training or threshold based training within this small band of at and just below, or even at and just above, which I'll get to in a second, is we're trying to improve things like our buffering ability of, of lactic acid. So we're trying to be able to get better at essentially tolerating dumping bicarbonate in the system to, to I guess, dissipate as much of that acidity and that burning sensation in the legs as we can. We're also trying to get better at shuttling lactate to be able to then take it to where it needs to go to reconvert it, to be able to use it as fuel. We're trying to get better at a little bit of the aerobic process as well to be able to delay the onset of lactic acid accumulating or blood lactate being produced. All of these factors, good but we're only going to get so much stimulus by going at and just below threshold because we're still dealing with relatively low blood lactate numbers and as i mentioned in that initial video we're talking about four millimoles on average for for most people i say most people because not everyone is going to be roughly where lactate threshold sits if we're at and just below we're talking about three and a half millimoles here 3.7 maybe it's moderate lactate but it's not really massive amounts to cause any concern really so it's going to give us an okay stimulus you can do some of the longer sustained efforts, which might be a bit more specific or applicable to our longer distance athletes out there. But it's the type of thing that's it's going to be it's going to be useful for a period, and then we have to do something else. And that's where working at and just above threshold is a really kicker, a really big kicker for me in terms of I really love using it because we actually get a little bit more stimulus. Now we're starting to talk about all right, we're working in ranges of four and a half, five, six millimoles. If you're a, if you're an athlete who's got a blood lactate reading of six at your threshold, we're now pushing into six and a half, seven. So it's all relative in terms of where you're at. 
But it's the type of thing we push a little bit further, it really challenges the body. And that's where we get a really nice stimulus because we're, we're allowing the body to work at a, at, a, at a range or an intensity that hasn't necessarily been capable of tolerating perfectly before. But that's the whole point of training, isn't it? Is to practice and get better at that um, at that intensity or that stimulus and, and be able to deal with that stimulus in a, in a much po- more positive way and a better performance outcome as a result. So this is where we start to talk about things like less than 10 minute efforts. It, interval training is a really easy way to do this. Your 1K repeats type fall into this category. Things like your monofart like start to fall, uh, fall into this category. Um, I, I like doing a session of Five, one by five, five by one. So five minutes on just above threshold. So 105% of your FTP, whatever you like to call it, 110% even if you're really pushing it, two and a half minute easy reco- recovery jog, and then get into five one minute efforts, even higher again in intensity, you might be going up to 110, 115%. You're starting to get to close to VO2 max ranges, which I'll get to in a moment in terms of how that can improve your, your threshold as well. But it's the type of thing where we're getting a much faster intensity in there. So it's really challenging the body, but then we're having these short recoveries. And really that's the key in these threshold type these t- threshold type efforts when we're talking specific intensities in and around threshold is having equal work to rest. So one-to-one, so you might do five minutes on, five minutes float, for example. So you could do uh, like five minutes on at 100% threshold, five minutes off at 75, 80% threshold. So it's more of like, a, I guess, a float rather than a jog or more work than rest. So we're talking two two to one, three to one, four to one. So you could do, like I said before, a, a tempo type effort of 20 minutes on, you could then do five minutes off. That's a four to one work to rest. You could do um, you could do 10 minutes on, five minutes off. There's a two to one work to rest ratio. For things like six minutes on or five minutes on, two and a half minutes off, I like to use two to one because it's a little bit shorter and sharper then. We get a really good stimulus out of it. But for anything longer than that sort of 10 minute mark, you can start to shorten up that rest because likely your intensity is down as well to be able to match that longer effort in the first place. So they're the two ways in and around threshold itself. The other way we can start to extend um, is from an indirect method. And I've had a really great amount of success with athletes who've been able to improve things like FTP by 30 watts, 40 watts over a short period of time by not even focusing in and around threshold and not doing necessarily specific training, so to say, or, or so to speak. It's more about improving the size of their engine because it comes a point where we can only extend out this graph to the right as, as far as our top end of the engine will let us. Coming back to an example I like to use all the time, we talk about our aerobic engine or our, our body essentially is like a car engine. If you're a V6 engine, you can only fit six cylinders in it. That's like having a, a threshold of 90 to 95% of your VO2 max. It's the type of thing that we're looking at well, I can't actually squeeze more out of it because the top end of my engine won't allow it. The top end, the VO2 max is going to be a f- five to seven minute effort flat out maximum. That's all we can do. Your threshold is going to be a 45 to an hour effort. So there has to be a gap in between. You can't have your threshold here and your VO2 max there and you definitely can't have threshold e- exceed where your VO2 max intensity is. So there always has to be a bit of a gap. So it's the type of thing, if we can extend that gap out by improving our VO2 max side of things, well, now I've got all this room to move and I can actually start to bring it up. And that's where things like two minutes on, equal walking recovery, um, three minutes on, three minutes off, working way up there, way above threshold, right up close to VO2 max, 95% of VO2 max, 100%. I've done a video on this, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much. I'll link, link it above and down below as well about how you can make the most of VO2 style efforts. But these can have an indirect result on things like threshold because if we've got a bigger engine, if I've now got a V8 engine, well, a V8 engine running on six cylinders compared to a V6 running on six, is always gonna be more powerful, but then I've also got room to fit in another two cylinders. So then I can go back and do that more specific threshold train to get those smaller gains. You can get things like 15, 30 watt or, or significant pace jumps if you're running out of the threshold specific type training. But if you're at a stage where you're an athlete who hasn't done much of the VO2 stuff and probably has a lot of room to grow there, that's where extending the top end of the engine out is gonna get you that really quick 30 to 40 watt gain or a really big dramatic jump then you can capitalize on that later. So it's always, a, it's always a good way to go about it in that direction. The only way you can identify this really is by having some sort of baseline in terms of testing. So understanding physiological data and having a look at, well, what are my strengths and weaknesses? You can then identify which path you need to head down. But really that's just a bit of a summary about the ways I move through threshold training and the different types of threshold training I like to use. A couple of ideas of some types of sessions you might wanna throw in there as well for a bit of variety using some of these uh, these types of sessions. Have you had any success with these? Let me know in the comments below if you use something similar. As I said at the beginning of the video, if you use something different, these aren't the only three ways you can go about it. Please let, let me know what you use down below, what's worked, what hasn't. Always happy to have that discussion and answer any questions that you do have. As always, please consider subscribing to the channel down below to keep supporting it. That is it for today and we'll see you in the next one.